Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Kendrick, president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, and I'm chopping it up with Buck. All right, welcome to Chopping It Up with Buck. I've got Bob Kendrick of the Negro League Baseball Museum. And, and Bob and I have talked, and I've gotten to know him. It's interesting through a mutual friend of ours who is no longer here, man, but I still see him, I hear him. And I'm so happy that Buck O'Neill kind of brought us together in a circuitous route. But I'm so glad to have you on today. How are you doing? Charles, man, I'm doing great. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be on with you. This has been Kind of a long time in the making, but we finally got hooked up. Uh, and I I got to thank my friend Buck O'Neill for getting this connection generated. Yeah. Well, you know, I met him at the, um, it was in Indianapolis. Uh, I can't remember, the Circle City Classic, and he was actually speaking. And I was just blown away by his stories. I love great stories. And he was yes. one of the awesome storytellers, man. Whenever you saw him on something, I had to turn it on. I had to watch. I got his book. I had my son read his book. I was a big ball baseball player growing up, so I knew the Negro Leagues intimately because of my grandfather and other men around me and getting to know even my stepdad, who his uncle played in the Negro League. So that part to me is just always oh, you hear the stories, but I don't think people know when you actually meet those guys and you get around them and you understand who they are, the value mm-hmm. and how much you treasure that. It, it, it's it's something that I feel tremendously blessed mm-hmm. to have had the opportunity to know so many of those old Negro League players. And, and, and Charles, sad to say we've lost so many of them. And it feels as if we're losing them at, you know, just a rapid rate. Yeah. And we knew that from the onset. When we started this museum way back in 1990, we knew then that it was literally going to be a race against time. It wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when they were all going to be gone. But man, what a tremendous blessing it's been for me. I got to hang out with Buck O'Neill and Ernie Banks and Minnie Minoso and all these other Negro League players and hear their experiences and draw inspiration from the things that I heard and had them share with me, and now I get to share those stories with others now. Yeah. You know, I didn't live the experiences like they did, mm-hmm. but I, I have these firsthand accounts to draw from, and now I get to share those stories with folks, and it, it's, it's been a tremendous blessing. What, what was, what's been the biggest thing for you? You were a basketball guy growing up. I mean, <laughs> we'll, we'll get into your history next time because we're going to uh, Kevin and I, my producer, are actually going to come. He was there for the Super Bowl. You guys may have met, but he didn't get a chance to spend time. I want to come and see the museum and come back when it's built. I want to make that a almost an annual trip just yes. to be a part of that. But what was it like hearing the stories or who what, what story have we not ever heard that you got to hear from any of those guys that you just mentioned? It, there have been so many. Yeah. It, it really has. And, and, and Charles, I remember so vividly of walking into what was then a very much fledgling Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Mm-hmm. At that time, we were across the street from where we currently operate inside <laughs> the historic Lincoln Building in an office a fraction of the size of my office. And I remember walking into that office and the late Don Motley was the executive director at that time. And I'm looking for this museum. And I peep my head in. I say, well, I'm looking for the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And he says, son, you're standing in it. And and little did I know, man, that I had literally just walked into what would become my passion. I fell in love with the story. And I fell in love with the amazing athletes who made this story. But I think the thing that surprised me the most, I knew that there was great talent that called the Negro Leagues home. And as I got more engaged in this story, it was clearly evidence that some of the greatest athletes to ever play this game called the Negro Leagues home. Charles, it was their spirits, though, that were captivating. Mm. That is what captivated you. Because, and I think most folks who are listening would agree with me, had they been bitter 
about the things that transpired in their lives as they were trying to play baseball, every one of us would have said, you had every right to be better. Oh, yeah. But to a player that I have ever met, not one of them ever harbored any bitterness or expressed any ill will toward anyone who may have attempted to perpetrate something against them. And I found that spirit so endearing. It took me a minute to kind of wrap my arms around why this could be. But first and foremost, man, they were never going to be bitter about baseball because Mm -hmm. they knew that they were playing the best baseball that could be played. Now, the world said the best baseball was being played in the major league. They never believed that. (laughs) They knew how good they were. They knew how good their league was. And quite frankly, the major leaguers knew how good they were. The stories are endless about them playing all-star games and the the, the major leaguers getting beat soundly and beat <laughs> by these guys consistently. And Satchel Page talking trash like he normally would. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna throw. I'm gonna throw it, and I dare you to hit that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I love, but I guess Mike, you know, the guy that I always look to. I mean, I love all of the guys, but something about Josh Gibson story. It, it it gives me goosebumps. Whenever I go to Washington National Stadium, I go by his, his by the statue. Statue and I, a I beautiful just statue, statue of him. Yeah, yes. I and was just I, there a few weeks ago. I, I've heard so many people, Buck being one, but others that talked about how the sound of the ball came off the bat and how Babe Ruth even said, "This dude is the truth." In in, oh. in those terms, he was, <laughs> in many ways. He was our John Henry. Yeah. yeah. He was our John Henry. He was almost mythical like yeah. because of the power and the mm-hmm. stories behind the power. But as I tell people all the time, Charles, the power was real. Now, yeah. everywhere you go and you hear the Negro League players talk about it, and you can see it referenced in many newspaper clippings mm-hmm. if you delve deeper into this, they don't measure places in the ballpark that Gibson hit the ball. They, they look at out. landmarks. Yeah, they look at, <laughs> they look at landmarks. They say, you see that tree over there? Yeah, Josh yeah. hit one over there. You see that warehouse <laughs> over there? Josh hit one over there. Train track? Yeah, he hit one over there. That's, I mean, that's how prolific the power was. But I think one of the things that surprises me, and we hear the story of how he is still believed to be the only man to ever hit a ball completely out of Yankee Stadium. Mm. That is prolific. Mantle hit one that hit the light stanch and that mm. would have gone out otherwise. But you know what I find so interesting? People will accept that, but they don't want to believe that Josh could hit it out the ballpark. Well, if Mantle <laughs> could hit the light stanch, I know doggone well Josh Gibson could hit the ball. <laughs> if you look at the physique of Josh Gibson, I tell people, if you want to compare him physically Ooh. to someone, yeah. think Bo Jackson as a catcher and you've got Josh Gibson. And, yeah. and so, but the thing that I think for me, the most amazing feat of them all was he hit one in the right field upper deck in Yankee Stadium. He was fooled on a changeup, Charles, wow. and he hit it in the upper deck one handed. <laughs> mm. Golly. Yeah, it, it, it's amazing to hear those stories and just, but you said something about not being bitter. But, you know, I have to say, how do we carry on the tradition? Because there was some, there was a controversy with uh, one of the one of the uh, baseball guys that got yes. into, and I know I saw you know the the whole thing that come to see the museum. Yes, he he, he said something that sounded unlike Negro. We had a phenomenal day today, Negro League Museum and Arthur Bryant's barbecue. I mean, there were a lot of folks who felt like my statement was justified and felt it was graceful and that I wasn't doing it for any of that. I have to remain true to who I am. This man made a mistake. It was a horrible mistake. Mm -hmm. But once he issued his apology and he apologized during the broadcast, apologized again after the game and called me to apologize to me, man, Mm -hmm. that's enough for me. That's enough for me. You know, I cannot harbor that kind of bitterness toward another human being for making a mistake because in my heart, that is exactly what it was. Now, if you don't agree with me, that's fine. If you yeah. want to be angry and mad at, at, at him, at Glenn, then you have every right to do so. Yeah. 
Yeah. But please understand that for me, the person and human being that I am, I mm-hmm. do carry a spirit of forgiveness. Now I've been called Uncle Tom for being carrying that spirit, and that's okay. Call yeah. me whatever you want to call me, but you're not going to change who I am as an individual, as a human being, and as a steward of this story where they were constantly overcoming this level of adversity. But yeah. this institution is predicated on that. Yeah. Uh, these athletes never cried about the social injustice. Man, they went out and did something about it. You won't let yeah. me play with you. I create my own. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and you bring up a really good point. Think of the injustices and the slights and the things that were happening to them in the Jim Crow South and all the other places where they had to go through. I mean, I I got a chance to see the Indianapolis Clowns, I think it is, their facility uh, before they kind of, I, I don't know what they've done with it, but I was living in Indy. And it just always amazed me at some of the, you know, places, but some of these guys were forefront guys. They were uh, the owners of these teams. Sometimes they took advantage of guys, but sometimes they were, when they were right, it allowed us to have a game and have our own game and to prosper in that game. Yes. What you've kind of been a steward of. Oh, absolutely. For such a long time. Absolutely. You think about this, Charles. It is the only major professional league that has been owned by black folks, mm-hmm. the Negro Leagues. Mm. And it provided a playing ground for the best black and Hispanic athlete to showcase yeah. their world-class baseball abilities. But it also became the third largest black-owned business in this country. And, and so this was a thriving black enterprise, contrary to popular belief. And Mm -hmm. the black owners who financed these teams made pretty good money doing so. The ball players made a decent living playing the game that they loved. Uh, And so it is incumbent upon this museum to help bring the entire story of the Negro Leagues to life. When you come here to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, man, we almost de-emphasize the athletes because we already know that you're going to walk through that museum and you're going to meet some of the greatest athletes to ever put on a baseball uniform. And you'll hear me refer to them oftentimes as great athletes who just happened to play baseball because they could have played anything. When I tell people that Jackie Robinson's weakest sport, his weakest sport was mm-hmm. baseball. I mean, it blows them away. But he was a much better basketball, <laughs> football, track athlete. And Charles, some say an even better tennis player. So there was nothing that Jackie Robinson could not do. Well, and I'm a UCLA guy. So (laughs) when I, I I mean, it it still blows me away when I think of him and Kenny Washington, another forefront guy that we don't talk enough about. That we don't talk about. On that campus. But Jackie also, I got a chance this summer to just go and visit uh, the Rose Bowl. And there's a statue of him out front of the Rose Bowl because he was at Pasadena City College. And his brother, Mac, was a hell of an athlete. A tremendous <laughs> athlete. Jackie swears that Mac was a better athlete than he was, which is absolutely frightening. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it and and a, you know, the thing that yeah. I find so interesting, you mentioned the UCLA connection and Kenny Washington. We highlight Kenny's story down inside the museum as well. And our new Barrier Breaker exhibit, Kenny Washington was actually a better baseball player at UCLA than Jackie Robinson was. And Jackie was likely a better football player at UCLA than Kenny Washington was. Yet Kenny would re-break the color barrier in the National Football League. And then Jackie yeah. would break the color barrier uh, and re-break the color barrier in Major League Baseball. It, you talk about social change and justice. Jackie went through some things later in his life where people you know, branded him a guy that wasn't always on the forefront. But when you break a barrier, I think that you hold a special place. And he was trying to find his way. And I think, you know, all of the things he had to take oh. you know, probably led to his demise way oh. earlier than it should have been. Yeah, now. no, he died. He dies relatively young, particularly by yeah. today's standards, mm-hmm. because he dealt with an insurmountable amount of pressure. Mm-hmm. I, I tell people all the time, if you do not believe that one man can invoke change, you need to look no further than Jackie Roosevelt Robinson. When he walked out on that field, and Charles, I mean this literally, obviously, figuratively, he was carrying 21 million Black folks on his back because had he failed, an entire race of people would have failed. 
and the fact that we were all counting on him. So it wasn't just the social pressure that he was getting. He was carrying the weight of us counting on him. We were depending on Jackie to be successful because this was going to now open up greater acceptance of us in the eyes of white baseball fans and I think white people in general. So he's carrying this weight on both sides. Mm. Yeah, he had he has to succeed. He <laughs> cannot fail. And baseball, as you know, is a game of failure. Mm-hmm. At its crux, it is a game of failure. If you get three hits every 10 trips to the plate, man, you're a Hall of Famer. That's how tough this game is. <laughs> is. And he cannot fail. Yeah. Well, Bob, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back uh, on Chopping It Up with Bob. At Heslip Wealth Advisors, our goal is to help small businesses develop quality retirement plans for their employees through our Lunch and Learn seminars. We provide lunch and learning tools to help your company succeed and unmatched customer service. All right, we're back. We're chopping it up with Buck, with Bob Kendrick, the executive director. I, I just say the guru, the PhD, <laughs> the, the guy. That and, and Bob, I'm, I'm serious. We got to get back there, Kevin and I, because I think Kansas City. A lot of people know it for barbecue, but the Royals organization, and then also many others in that Kansas City community, have been so welcoming and been so good to you guys. What has that relationship been like for the with uh, the, the museum and the city of Kansas City? It, it's been tremendous. It's tre- it's been tremendous, and I oftentimes say that the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum is Kansas City's gift to the rest of the world. Okay. But the love that we get here in Kansas City as one of its most unique and popular attractions, uh, it has been amazing, and the support that we get from the philanthropic community here in Kansas City in particular, is exceptional. Our relationship with the ball club, the Kansas City Royals, has been an amazing relationship and it's continuing to grow. And, you know, just this year, for the second year in a row, the Kansas City Royals basically bought admission for any and everyone who wanted to come and visit the museum during the month of February. And we saw record attendance of over 14,000 people in the month of February raising well over $120,000 in support for the museum through the generosity of the Kansas City Royals and Royals charities. And we're seeing more and more Major League Baseball teams come to visit when they make their way to Kansas City. Once upon a time, Charles, it was me calling the teams and asking, you know, you got time, bring the players by here. Now the teams are calling me saying, we want to come and bring our athletes to your museum And that just warms my heart, man, because the word is starting to spread amongst themselves. See, there's no better advocate than the guys who come here and then they call their guys and say, hey, man, when you're in Kansas City, you need to go by and visit the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And and it never gets old for me. Every time a young athlete walks through this museum, and I don't care whether they are a baseball player, football player, basketball player, it doesn't matter. Whatever sports discipline If it's a team sport Mm -hmm. and you play it professionally in this country, all roads lead back to the Negro Leagues. And the thing that I oftentimes talk about with them, the common denominator that they share with those who played in the Negro Leagues is love of the game. You Mm -hmm. play this game because you love it, but you will never see a greater example of love of the game than you do when you walk through the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. They had to love it in order to endure the things that they had to endure, and yet it never killed their love. Whatever the set of social circumstances they had to deal with, so be it. I'm going to keep playing ball. And really, that's the spirit that you feel here when you walk through this museum. Yeah, you said the spirits, and I love that because it, we, our people have been that way. And, and we, when you, you understand the things, the trials and tribulations, the slavery, Jim Crow, we still, we still thrive. We resiliency. Still, we still yeah. thrive. It, it, it's, thing, it's all yeah. based on resiliency, the, yeah. that, that resilient spirit. Mm-hmm. But the one thing that I, I'm curious about, because I've been to the African-American Museum in Washington, D.C. I go to museums because I, I like, I'm a history major and I like to see that. What has been 
the reaction of people when they walk in and they actually get to see the first time, like they've talked about it, they can yeah. see it, it, you know, that you can see it on online, but it's nothing like, tell, yeah. tell me those experiences that you see from your vantage point of watching people actually walk through the museum. They are blown away. They really are. They are amazed by what they learn. But honestly, Charles, they leave a little bit dismayed because you just now had an opportunity to learn this. You go mm -hmm. leaving wondering why in the world did I not know this when I was going to school? And the answer is very simple. American historians did us all a tremendous disservice. They kept this wonderful chapter of baseball and Americana away from us. So thus, we all went through our formal educations without knowing one of the most significant chapters, not in baseball history, but in American history. And, and that is what this rich, compelling, inspirational story of the Negro Leagues is all about. So number one, I think they gain a much different perspective than they probably did before they came, because I, I do believe the more majority of our visitors come expecting that this story is going to be sad and somber because we know that it is anchored against the backdrop of American segregation, a horrible chapter in this country's history. But the real story here is what emerged out of segregation. This wonderful story of triumph and conquest and is all based on one simple principle. You won't let me play with you in the major leagues. I'll create a league of my own. And when you stop to think about that, that is the American way. And so while America was trying to prevent these athletes from playing her so-called American national pastime, it was the American spirit that allowed them to persevere and prevail. And, and what's not to love about a story like that? Yeah. I want to get back to our buddy, Buck O'Neill, who was not only a great player, but he was a coach. He, uh, he he did so many things, but so some many of the things. things we don't know or people don't know, like you got the opportunity to get to know Buck, that maybe it's just that even blew you away after so many years of knowing him, being around him. Well, you know, like everyone else, when you meet Buck, it's love at first sight. It's just, it's just, no question about it. It's love at first sight. And, hey, and Bob, you, and that handshake, man. Oh, big Ooh. hand. Yeah, yeah, you better you better get in there. You better get in there good. Because those big hands, man, you yeah, and all the firm hands. But that gentle spirit that drove him, you know, the human qualities of this man was just exceptional. And, and Charles, I asked him, I said, man, where did this come from? This amazing ability to love universally, to see the good in everyone. Sometimes, even when they weren't good, Buck saw the good in them. And you know what he told me? He said, my dad had told me when I was a little boy, treat every man the way you want to be treated. The golden rule. Now, we all know the golden rule. We just don't all live the golden rule. And Buck took something that his father said to him as a kid, and it governed him throughout his life. And he left a trail right behind him of those who were touched by him and their lives were changed. I witnessed this. I'm not telling you what I think. Now, I'm telling you what I know because I saw this. The man never met a stranger in his life. If he didn't know you, he wanted to know you. And then you would meet. And the next thing you know, as you're about to depart, you're sharing an embrace as if you had known each other all your life. There was something very innate about this man. And I liken it to what you see with a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a Mother Teresa, Gandhi. He just had that innateness about him and the ability and the willingness to spread love. Because as he would oftentimes say, it's much easier to love than it is to hate. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love his story too. And his nickname, his nickname from Satchel was Nancy. It right? was Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he always had great stories about Satchel Page. What what one that you like that he shared with you the best? I mean, I, I you can talk about him throwing and making sure but oh, it just seemed like they were such good They were such good, friends. they were such good friends. And yeah. and Buck believed that. And he always said this if I had one game to win. And any choice of 
any pitcher from any era, it would be the legendary Satchel Page. Now, he said you might beat him when he was out there messing around. But Charles, when he was locked and loaded, mm. forget about it. And, and so they're playing in the Denver Post Tournament. Yeah. Satchel and his Satchel Page All-Stars. And Buck is playing first base for Satchel's All-Stars. And Satchel's on the mound. They're playing an all-white semi-pro team from the Coors Brewing Company. And so Buck says the first kid gets into the batter's box, he digs in, Satchel throws him a fastball, kid swung as hard as he could, topped it, dribbled it down the third base line, it stays fair, he beats it out and gets an infield hit. Well, Buck says about that time, one of the kids from the Coors dugout steps out on top of the dugout steps, and he yells out, let's beat him, he ain't nothing but an overrated darkie. Well, I mm. think Satchel might have been more offended by being called overrated than he was <laughs> by being called a doctor. <laughs> and so Satchel looks over at first base and he says, Nancy, did you hear that? Buck said, yes, Satchel, I heard him. He said, Nancy, bring him in. And so Buck <laughs> is at first base, Charles. He says he turns and he motions for the outfield to take a couple of steps in. Satchel looks over at first base. He says, Nancy, bring them all the way in. <laughs> Honest to God's truth, y'all, there were nine, se- I mean, eight guys kneeling, seven guys, I'm sorry, kneeling around the mound, Satchel and the catcher, and Satchel strikes out the side on nine straight pitches. Buck says Satchel looks into the dugout and looks over at the Coors team and says, overrated, darky, hey. And, of course, by now, the kid that said this, he was embarrassed. He was crying. And Buck said they all came out to apologize to Satchel and his teammates. But like I said, Buck O'Neill swore to the day he died, if he had one game to win, it would be the legendary Satchel Page that he would peg to go win that game. (laughs) I love uh, every time I hear a story like that or that story in particular, I love it because I, I I can just imagine Satchel Page telling Buck. And, 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 and here's the cool thing about it. As you know, for the first time, the Negro Leagues are in the video game MLB, the show. And the mode that features the Negro Leagues is called Storylines. And so I'm inside the video game narrating these stories. Well, that wow. story that I just shared is part of the video game. And so through animation, you can now see what this looked like with Satchel calling the outfield in and the infield down to sit down as he proceeded to strike out these guys. And actually, as you play as Satchel, that's one of the things that you have to do. You got to strike out the side on nine pitches and hard to keep (laughs) advancing. And and so now we're super excited about this video game and the reaction that this video game has gotten because young kids and young adults are falling in love with the Negro Leagues through this digital platform. I got to admit, man, I had no idea that that platform is as large as it is. Oh, it, yeah. It's been amazing. Well, you know, let's talk a little bit too about one of the great legends, the Black Aces, uh, Vital Blue, who just passed. Oh, oh that, that hurt my heart. I, I never got the chance to meet uh, Vital Blue, but growing up as a left-handed pitcher, that was my idol. That was the guy that I looked at. He looked like me. He could throw. He was just, uh, I, I heard a great man just from all indications. Yeah, I've never yeah. met him, but just, you know, so sad to see that. Uh, no, you, we, how, how well did you know uh, Vita Blue? And I'm, I'm sure you guys spent quite a bit of time together. You know, he was a dear friend. He's, he he made a number of visits to this museum playing in Buck O'Neill's Golf Classic and good golfer. And I would see him whenever I went out to San Francisco through his involvement with the Giants and out there in the Bay Area. 73 years old, man, that's too young. Yeah. That is too young. We lost him way too soon. And I don't know if people realize just how great a pitcher he really was. And as a matter of fact, we will open up a brand new exhibit the end of this month that honors the Black Aces. Mm. You know, late great Jim Mudcat Grant kind of coined that phrase to pay tribute to now 15, only in the history of Major League Baseball, only 15 African-American pitchers have won 20 games or more in a given season. 
Well, yeah. part of that is because that position did not transition from the Negro Leagues. There was this underlying belief that we weren't smart enough to play that position. But in the yeah. history of Major League Baseball, only 15. Mudcat was the first to do it in the American League. Of course, Don Newcomb, the great Don Newcomb, was first to yeah. do it in the National League. But we're going to take a retrospective look back and teach you about the great black and Hispanic pitchers of the Negro Leagues. And then it moves all the way into Mudcat's group that includes, like I mentioned, Mudcat, Don Newcomb, Bob Gibson, mm -hmm. guys who Bob are still Gibson, with us. Bob Gibson, now, that was a guy that Ooh. I know from Dusty. Dusty oh, would yeah. Say, hey, he said the first time he got in the, in the, in the, the <laughs> box against him, he asked, Hank, you know, what do I need to do? Because I heard you can't dig in, you can't do this. <laughs> you know, he told him a bunch of rules, and Dusty said, well, what can I do? He said, just go hit the ball. If you hit it far, just keep running, but don't look at him crazy. <laughs> <laughs> don't look at him. He so, said, yeah, don't look at him. No, like a silverback. <laughs> he, he, he was a fierce competitor, as fierce a competitor as I think we've seen, not only in baseball, but in sports, you know, mm -hmm. and, and people don't realize what a great athlete Gibby, Gibby was. Gibby yeah. played for the Harlem Globetrotters. You know, mm -hmm. Gibby was a basketball star at Creighton. he was a golden glove. Yes, too, and right? then yeah. went on to play for the Globetrotters before embarking on a Hall of Fame career with the St. Louis Cardinals. Tremendous athlete. So, you know, he's featured in this exhibit all the way up through guys who are still with us, the CeCe Sabathias, Dontrell Willis, David Price, Doc Gooden, of course, Vida Blue. And we're dedicating this exhibit to Vida, you know, with his passing. We lost Jim Mudcat Grant a couple of years ago, man, and there's a void in my heart. Every time we lose these guys, these are guys who were dear friends of mine. You know, that had that kind of comes with the territory. You get to know these guys, and every time you lose one of them, you really feel like you've lost a member of your family. And to lose Vida, and it just was heartbreaking for me. And, you know, I just send my condolences to his family and to his fans, man. We're going to miss him tremendously. But as we open up this new exhibit, it will be dedicated to the late, great Vita Blue. So, so Bob, how soon or how long before you open up the new 30,000 square feet? Yeah. I mean, it's going to be awesome. I can't wait to see where you are now, but also the new, uh, you know, the new location as well. Tell us a little yeah. bit about that. As soon as I raise that $25 million. <laughs> 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 well, we're, we're, we're here to support you any way well, we can. And, 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 thanks, bucks, and thanks to yeah. my friends over at Bank of America, they made the first million dollar contribution. <laughs> so I'm 125th of the way home. <laughs> 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 but Charles, I'm so excited about this. Again, think about this, man. A museum that started in a one room office mm. where they literally took turns paying the monthly rent. These were former Negro League players who took turns paying the monthly rent to keep the little office open, which allowed us to build our current home. And along that journey, we're now recognized as America's National Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And here we are now on the cusp of building an international headquarters for both Black baseball and social history as the gateway into historic 18th and Vine here in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. You're saving the old Paseo YMCA, which is going to be converted into the Buck O'Neill Education and Research Center. Well, the YMCA is where the Negro Leagues were formed in 1920 and had been abandoned for years. So we're rehabbing that building, and then we will build a new structure attached to it, and it's going to give us 70-plus thousand square feet of space dedicated to this story. We, in essence, are creating a Negro Leagues campus. There will be nothing like this in this country. And, and we're very proud to be able to make that next big step in the growth of this museum. It is a daunting task, but I know that we are more than prepared to meet the challenge to raise the funds necessary to do this. And, and I think the world will be looking at Kansas City through the lens of the Negro Leagues. That's awesome. Well, we, we have a thing called two minute drill, but I'll call it extra innings for baseball. Just a couple of quick questions top off the mind so we can get you out of here. It's been great. We got to do this again. <laughs> it took us too long, but I'm glad we yeah, no, no, man, next, I'm looking And next time we're going to do it in front of you where we're, we have some food. We uh, usually like to go on location and just sit down and chop it up and just have uh, a good time. Oh, I can't <laughs> wait. I can't wait. I'm looking forward so, to it. So my first one for you, since we're talking Kansas City, I'm going to give you five. 
How, what, give me your, your top five barbecue places in Kansas City that you got to go to when you come to town. Well, for me, it starts with Gates. Now, okay. let me preface that by saying I'm a little biased because the owner, Ollie Gates, he's 90 years old. He's still doing it. Still works in the restaurant. He is helping me build a Buckle Neal Education and Research Center. Okay, so, <laughs> so Gates Barbecue is one of, the, one of the top ones. We got to put him in there. That's why I yeah, so five, Gates got to be at the top. <laughs> yeah, Gates got to be at the top of the list. Uh, I also am a fan of Kansas City Joe's. Okay. Jack Stacks. Then you got, you know, the legendary Arthur Bryant. Yeah. And, and then there are two others that I think are really great. Char Bar which is over in the Westport area, has some of the best burn-ins. And, you know, mm. burn-ins have become a kind of a delicacy here yeah. in Kansas City. And, y'all, if you hadn't had burn-ins, man, you got to come to Kansas City and, and try them. They are amazing. So I, I would put them and Q39 as a wild card right there in my top five and 5A uh, of I, places I that you got to go eat barbecue when you come to Kansas City. Well, you got us way down the field. You know, we usually back you up, but man, those, all of those are good. And I've been to a few of them, and I got to try the other ones. You know, I've had burn ins, but I will never turn down any good burn ins. I could eat them all <laughs> every day of the week. You, you know, when when you when you think about some of these great guys you've gotten to know, who is one of the most underrated or unsung that we didn't really hear about, but just you know his greatness because everybody else talks about it. Yeah, yeah, and that player for me, and there are several, mm -hmm. but I think at the top of that list is a Cuban ball player by the name of Martin De Higo. Mm. His nickname was El Maestro, the master, okay. because Charles, he could do it all. Played all nine positions, played all nine of them well. He is the only baseball player in the history of our sport to be enshrined into five different countries Baseball Halls of Fame. Wow. The Mexican, <laughs> Cuban, Venezuelan, Dominican, and in Cooperstown. One year in the Mexican League, DeHigo wins the pitching title, man. He goes 18 and 2 with a ridiculous 0.90 ERA. Oh, but wait, it gets even better. The sucker hits 387 that same season wow. <laughs> and won the batting title. And how in the world could we have not heard of a ball player of this magnitude? But that's mm -hmm. the plight of the Negro Leagues. And, and that is why it is so important that you have a museum like this that can finally shine light on these, I call them baseball's unsung heroes. But there are so many others like Martin De Higo. Yeah, I just, my most recent episode of my podcast, Black Diamonds, I talk about the legendary Norman Turkey Stearns. Mm -hmm. Buck O'Neill called him the gobbler. And, and of course, Turkey is <laughs> one of those great nicknames in Negro Leagues, actually in baseball history. And, and Charles, he batted with a kind of pigeon-toed stance mm. and had a little bit of a pot belly. And, and when he ran, his arms flapped like a turkey. <laughs> but as I tell people, this turkey could flat out fly, man. Five-tool guy hit for power, hit for average, could feel, could run, could throw, led the Negro Leagues in home runs seven times. Wow. And seven times. We talk about the power of Josh Gibson. Mm -hmm. We don't hear about a guy like Norman Turkey Stearns. And the late, great, cool Papa Bell wow. once said that if Norman Turkey Stearns is not in the Hall of Fame, then no one should be in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Mm. <laughs> well, 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 Bob, I, hey, you scored an easy touchdown with that. I know, I knew you would. I just had to give you a tee, tee ball and let you knock it out of the park. <laughs> but man, thank you so much. I had so much fun. We could have kept doing this for a while, but next time we're doing it live, we got to do this consistently. Meet you at a ballpark. We'll, we'll figure out a bunch of different ways. And right. I, I, I love. Uh, let us know here, at chopping it up with Buck, how we can help get the word out, make sure people know. Um, I love the stories, but I also love the game uh, more than anything. And I think growing up with my grandfather, who taught me the game of baseball his, from a historical perspective, he had polio, he couldn't play, yeah. but he knew all the stories and he could tell me 
uh, about the great players. And it gave me, and you know, his, his big thing was if I'd hit home runs in Little League, I'd get a hamburger. So <laughs> I, I'm out there trying to hit home runs for hamburgers and cheeseburgers. But I, I love that we can keep those traditions and stories alive and well. So thanks for coming on, chopping it up with Buck this week, my man. Hey, man, it's been an absolute honor. Thanks for having me.